A pragmatic theory of truth is a theory of truth within the philosophies of pragmatism and pragmaticism. Pragmatic theories of truth were first posited by Charles Sanders Peirce, William James, and John Dewey. The common features of these theories are a reliance on the pragmatic maxim as a means of clarifying the meanings of difficult concepts such as truth, and an emphasis on the fact that belief, certainty, knowledge, or truth is the result of an inquiry. Topic. Background Pragmatic theories of truth developed from the earlier ideas of ancient philosophy, the scholastics, and Immanuel Kant. Pragmatic ideas about truth are often confused with the quite distinct notions of logic and inquiry, judging what is true, and truth predicates. Topic: <laughs> Logic and inquiry. In one classical formulation, truth is defined as the good of logic, where logic is a normative science, that is, an inquiry into a good or a value that seeks knowledge of it and the means to achieve it. In this view, truth cannot be discussed to much effect outside the context of inquiry, knowledge, and logic, all very broadly considered. Most inquiries into the character of truth begin with a notion of an informative, meaningful, or significant element, the truth of whose information, meaning, or significance may be put into question and needs to be evaluated. Depending on the context, this element might be called an artifact, expression, image, impression, lyric, mark, performance, picture, sentence, sign, string, symbol, text, thought, token, utterance, word, work, and so on. Whatever the case, one has the task of judging whether the bearers of information, meaning, or significance are indeed truth-bearers. This judgment is typically expressed in the form of a specific truth predicate, whose positive application to a sign, or so on, asserts that the sign is true. Topic. Judging what is true Considered within the broadest horizon, there is little reason to imagine that the process of judging a work, that leads to a predication of false or true, is necessarily amenable to formalization, and it may always remain what is commonly called a judgment call. But there are indeed many well-circumscribed domains where it is useful to consider disciplined forms of evaluation, and the observation of these limits allows for the institution of what is called a method of judging truth and falsity. One of the first questions that can be asked in this setting is about the relationship between the significant performance and its reflective critique. If one expresses oneself in a particular fashion, and someone says, that's true, is there anything useful at all that can be said in general terms about the relationship between these two acts? For instance, does the critique add value to the expression criticized, does it say something significant in its own right, or is it just an insubstantial echo of the original sign? Topic. Truth predicates Theories of truth may be described according to several dimensions of description that affect the character of the predicate. True. The truth predicates that are used in different theories may be classified by the number of things that have to be mentioned in order to assess the truth of a sign, counting the sign itself as the first thing. In formal logic, this number is called the arity of the predicate. The kinds of truth predicates may then be subdivided according to any number of more specific characters that various theorists recognize as important. A monodic truth predicate is one that applies to its main subject, typically a concrete representation or its abstract content, independently of reference to anything else. In this case one can say that a truthbearer is true in and of itself. A dyadic truth predicate is one that applies to its main subject only in reference to something else, a second subject. Most commonly, the auxiliary subject is either an object, an interpreter, or a language to which the representation bears some relation. A triadic truth predicate is one that applies to its main subject only in reference to a second and a third subject. For example, in a pragmatic theory of truth, one has to specify both the object of the sign, and either its interpreter or another sign called the interpretant before one can say that the sign is true of its object to its interpreting agent or sign. Several qualifications must be kept in mind with respect to any such radically simple scheme of classification, as real practice seldom presents any pure types, and there are settings in which it is useful to speak of a theory of truth that is almost k-adic, or that would be k attic if certain details can be abstracted away and neglected in a particular context of discussion. 
That said, given the generic division of truth predicates according to their arity, further species can be differentiated within each genus according to a number of more refined features. The truth predicate of interest in a typical correspondence theory of truth tells of a relation between representations and objective states of affairs, and is therefore expressed, for the most part, by a dyadic predicate. In general terms, one says that a representation is true of an objective situation, more briefly, that a sign is true of an object. The nature of the correspondence may vary from theory to theory in this family. The correspondence can be fairly arbitrary or it can take on the character of an analogy, an icon, or a morphism, whereby a representation is rendered true of its object by the existence of corresponding elements and a similar structure. Peers Very little in Peirce's thought can be understood in its proper light without understanding that he thinks all thoughts are signs, and thus, according to his theory of thought, no thought is understandable outside the context of a sign relation. Sign relations taken collectively are the subject matter of a theory of signs. So Peirce's semiotic, his theory of sign relations, is key to understanding his entire philosophy of pragmatic thinking and thought. In his contribution to the article, Truth and Falsity and Error, for Baldwin's Dictionary of Philosophy and Psychology 1901, Pierce defines truth in the following way. Truth is that concordance of an abstract statement with the ideal limit towards which endless investigation would tend to bring scientific belief, which concordance the abstract statement may possess by virtue of the confession of its inaccuracy and one-sidedness, and this confession is an essential ingredient of truth. Pierce 1901, see Collected Papers CP 5.565. This statement emphasizes Peirce's view that ideas of approximation, incompleteness, and partiality, what he describes elsewhere as fallibilism and reference to the future, are essential to a proper conception of truth. Although Peirce occasionally uses words like concordance and correspondence to describe one aspect of the pragmatic sign relation, he is also quite explicit in saying that definitions of truth based on mere correspondence are no more than nominal definitions, which he follows long tradition in relegating to a lower status than real definitions. That truth is the correspondence of a representation with its object is, as Kant says, merely the nominal definition of it. Truth belongs exclusively to propositions. A proposition has a subject or set of subjects and a predicate. The subject is a sign, the predicate is a sign, and the proposition is a sign that the predicate is a sign of that of which the subject is a sign. If it be so, it is true. But what does this correspondence or reference of the sign, to its object, consist in? Pierce 1906, CP 5.553. Here Pierce makes a statement that is decisive for understanding the relationship between his pragmatic definition of truth and any theory of truth that leaves it solely and simply a matter of representations corresponding with their objects. Pierce, like Kant before him, recognizes Aristotle's distinction between a nominal definition, a definition in name only, and a real definition, one that states the function of the concept, the reason for conceiving it, and so indicates the essence, the underlying substance of its object. This tells us the sense in which Peirce entertained a correspondence theory of truth, namely, a purely nominal sense. To get beneath the superficiality of the nominal definition it is necessary to analyze the notion of correspondence in greater depth. In preparing for this task, Peirce makes use of an allegorical story, omitted here, the moral of which is that there is no use seeking a conception of truth that we cannot conceive ourselves being able to capture in a humanly conceivable concept. So we might as well proceed on the assumption that we have a real hope of comprehending the answer, of being able to handle the truth when the time comes. Bearing that in mind, the problem of defining truth reduces to the following form. Now thought is of the nature of a sign. In that case, then, if we can find out the right method of thinking and can follow it out, the right method of transforming signs, then truth can be nothing more nor less than the last result to which the following out of this method would ultimately carry us. In that case, that to which the representation should conform, is itself something in the nature of a representation, or sign—something noumenal, intelligible, conceivable, and utterly unlike a thing in itself. Pierce 1906, CP 5.553. Pierce's theory of truth depends on two other, intimately related subject matters, his theory of sign relations and his theory of inquiry. 
Inquiry is a special case of semiosis, a process that transforms signs into signs while maintaining a specific relationship to an object, which object may be located outside the trajectory of signs or else be found at the end of it. Inquiry includes all forms of belief revision and logical inference, including scientific method, what Pierce here means by the right method of transforming signs. A sign to sign transaction relating to an object is a transaction that involves three parties, or a relation that involves three roles. This is called a ternary or triadic relation in logic. Consequently, pragmatic theories of truth are largely expressed in terms of triadic truth predicates. The statement above tells us one more thing Pierce, having started out in accord with Kant, is here giving notice that he is parting ways with the Kantian idea that the ultimate object of a representation is an unknowable thing in itself. Pierce would say that the object is knowable, in fact, it is known in the form of its representation, however imperfectly or partially. Reality and truth are coordinate concepts in pragmatic thinking, each being defined in relation to the other, and both together as they participate in the time evolution of inquiry. Inquiry is not a disembodied process, nor the occupation of a singular individual, but the common life of an unbounded community. The real, then, is that which, sooner or later, information and reasoning would finally result in, and which is therefore independent of the vagaries of me and you. Thus, the very origin of the conception of reality shows that this conception essentially involves the notion of a community, without definite limits, and capable of a definite increase of knowledge. Pierce 1868, CP 5.311 Different minds may set out with the most antagonistic views, but the progress of investigation carries them by a force outside of themselves to one and the same conclusion. This activity of thought by which we are carried, not where we wish, but to a foreordained goal, is like the operation of destiny. No modification of the point of view taken, no selection of other facts for study, no natural bent of mind even, can enable a man to escape the predestinate opinion. This great law is embodied in the conception of truth and reality. The opinion which is fated to be ultimately agreed to by all who investigate, is what we mean by the truth, and the object represented in this opinion is the real. That is the way I would explain reality. Pierce 1878, CP 5.407 James William James's version of the pragmatic theory is often summarized by his statement that the true is only the expedient in our way of thinking, just as the right is only the expedient in our way of behaving." By this, James meant that truth is a quality the value of which is confirmed by its effectiveness when applying concepts to actual practice thus, pragmatic. James's pragmatic theory is a synthesis of correspondence theory of truth and coherence theory of truth, with an added dimension. Truth is verifiable to the extent that thoughts and statements correspond with actual things, as well as hangs together, or coheres, fits as pieces of a puzzle might fit together, and these are in turn verified by the observed results of the application of an idea to actual practice. James said that, all true processes must lead to the face of directly verifying sensible experiences somewhere. He also extended his pragmatic theory well beyond the scope of scientific verifiability, and even into the realm of the mystical. On pragmatic principles, if the hypothesis of God works satisfactorily in the widest sense of the word, then it is true. Truth, as any dictionary will tell you, is a property of certain of our ideas. It means their agreement, as falsity means their disagreement, with reality. Pragmatists and intellectualists both accept this definition as a matter of course. They begin to quarrel only after the question is raised as to what may precisely be meant by the term agreement, and what by the term reality, when reality is taken as something for our ideas to agree with. William James begins his chapter on Pragmatism's Conception of Truth in much the same letter and spirit as the above selection from Pierce 1906, noting the nominal definition of truth as a plausible point of departure, but immediately observing that the pragmatist's quest for the meaning of truth can only begin, not end there. The popular notion is that a true idea must copy its reality. Like other popular views, this one follows the analogy of the most usual experience. Our true ideas of sensible things do indeed copy them. Shut your eyes and think of yonder clock on the wall, and you get just such a true picture or copy of its dial. 
but your idea of its works unless you are a clockmaker is much less of a copy, yet it passes muster, for it in no way clashes with reality. Even though it should shrink to the mere word works, that word still serves you truly, and when you speak of the time-keeping function of the clock, or of its spring's elasticity, it is hard to see exactly what your ideas can copy. James exhibits a knack for popular expression that Pierce seldom sought, and here his analysis of correspondence by way of a simple thought experiment cuts right to the quick of the first major question to ask about it, namely, to what extent is the notion of correspondence involved in truth covered by the ideas of analogues, copies, or iconic images of the thing represented? The answer is that the iconic aspect of correspondence can be taken literally only in regard to sensory experiences of the more precisely eidetic sort. When it comes to the kind of correspondence that might be said to exist between a symbol, a word like works, and its object, the springs and catches of the clock on the wall, then the pragmatist recognizes that a more than nominal account of the matter still has a lot more explaining to do. Topic. Making truth Instead of truth being ready made for us, James asserts we in reality jointly make truth. This idea has two senses, one, truth is mutable, often attributed to William James and F. C. S. Schiller, and two, truth is relative to a conceptual scheme more widely accepted in pragmatism. One, mutability of truth. Truth is not readily defined in pragmatism. Can beliefs pass from being true to being untrue and back? For James, beliefs are not true until they have been made true by verification. James believed propositions become true over the long term through proving their utility in a person's specific situation. The opposite of this process is not falsification, but rather the belief ceases to be a live option. F.C.S. Schiller, on the other hand, clearly asserted beliefs could pass into and out of truth on a situational basis. Schiller held that truth was relative to specific problems. If I want to know how to return home safely, the true answer will be whatever is useful to solving that problem. Later on, when faced with a different problem, what I came to believe with the earlier problem may now be false. As my problems change, and as the most useful way to solve a problem shifts, so does the property of truth. C.S. Pierce considered the idea that beliefs are true at one time but false at another or true for one person but false for another to be one of the seeds of death by which James allowed his pragmatism to become infected. For Pierce the pragmatic view implies theoretical claims should be tied to verification processes i.e. they should be subject to test. They shouldn't be tied to our specific problems or life needs. Truth is defined, for Pierce, as what would be the ultimate outcome not any outcome in real time of inquiry by a usually scientific community of investigators. William James, while agreeing with this definition, also characterized truthfulness as a species of the good. If something is true it is trustworthy and reliable and will remain so in every conceivable situation. Both Pierce and Dewey connect the definitions of truth and warranted assertability. Hilary Putnam also developed his internal realism around the idea a belief is true if it is ideally justified in epistemic terms. About James's and Schiller's view, Putnam says, Truth cannot simply be rational acceptability for one fundamental reason. Truth is supposed to be a property of a statement that cannot be lost, whereas justification can be lost. The statement, the earth is flat, was, very likely, rationally acceptable 3,000 years ago, but it is not rationally acceptable today. Yet it would be wrong to say that the earth is flat was true 3,000 years ago, for that would mean that the earth has changed its shape. Putnam 1981, p. 55. Rorty has also weighed in against James and Schiller. Truth is, to be sure, an absolute notion, in the following sense. True for me but not for you. And true in my culture but not in yours. Are weird, pointless locutions. So is true then, but not now. James would, indeed, have done better to say that phrases like the good in the way of belief and what it is better for us to believe are interchangeable with justified, rather than with true. Rorty 1998, p. 2 2. Conceptual relativity With James and Schiller we make things true by verifying them, a view rejected by most pragmatists. However, nearly all pragmatists do accept the idea there can be no truths without a conceptual scheme to express those truths. That is, 
Unless we decide upon how we are going to use concepts like object, existence, etc., the question how many objects exist does not really make any sense. But once we decide the use of these concepts, the answer to the above-mentioned question within that use or version, to put in Nelson Goodman's phrase, is no more a matter of convention. Matra 2003p 40 FCS Schiller used the analogy of a chair to make clear what he meant by the phrase that truth is made, just as a carpenter makes a chair out of existing materials and doesn't create it out of nothing, truth is a transformation of our experience. But this doesn't imply reality is something we're free to construct or imagine as we please. <laughs> Dewey John Dewey, less broadly than William James but much more broadly than Charles Peirce, held that inquiry, whether scientific, technical, sociological, philosophical or cultural, is self-corrective over time if openly submitted for testing by a community of inquirers in order to clarify, justify, refine and or refute proposed truths. In his logic, The Theory of Inquiry 1938, Dewey gave the following definition of inquiry. Inquiry is the controlled or directed transformation of an indeterminate situation into one that is so determinate in its constituent distinctions and relations as to convert the elements of the original situation into a unified whole. Dewey, p. 108. The index of the same book has exactly one entry under the heading Truth, and it refers to the following footnote. The best definition of truth from the logical standpoint which is known to me is that by Pierce, the opinion which is fated to be ultimately agreed to by all who investigate is what we mean by the truth, and the object represented in this opinion is the real CP 5.407, Dewey, 343n. Dewey says more of what he understands by truth in terms of his preferred concept of warranted assertability as the end in view and conclusion of inquiry Dewey, 14-15. Topic. Mead Topic. Criticisms Several objections are commonly made to pragmatist account of truth, of either sort. First, due originally to Bertrand Russell 1907 in a discussion of James's theory, is that pragmatism mixes up the notion of truth with epistemology. Pragmatism describes an indicator or a sign of truth. It really cannot be regarded as a theory of the meaning of the word true. There's a difference between stating an indicator and giving the meaning. For example, when the street lights turn on at the end of a day, that's an indicator, a sign, that evening is coming on. It would be an obvious mistake to say that the word evening just means the time that the street lights turn on. In the same way, while it might be an indicator of truth, that a proposition is part of that perfect science at the ideal limit of inquiry, that just isn't what true means. Russell's objection is that pragmatism mixes up an indicator of truth with the meaning of the predicate true. There is a difference between the two and pragmatism confuses them. In this pragmatism is akin to Berkeley's view that to be is to be perceived, which similarly confuses an indication or proof of that something exists with the meaning of the word exists, or with what it is for something to exist. Other objections to pragmatism include how we define what it means to say a belief works, or that it is useful to believe. The vague usage of these terms, first popularized by James, has led to much debate. A final objection is that pragmatism of James's variety entails relativism. What is useful for you to believe might not be useful for me to believe. It follows that truth for you is different from truth for me and that the relevant facts don't matter. This is relativism. A viable, more sophisticated consensus theory of truth, a mixture of Piercean theory with speech act theory and social theory, is that presented and defended by Jürgen Habermas, which sets out the universal pragmatic conditions of ideal consensus and responds to many objections to earlier versions of a pragmatic, consensus theory of truth. Habermas distinguishes explicitly between factual consensus, i.e. the beliefs that happen to hold in a particular community, and rational consensus, i.e. Consensus attained in conditions approximating an ideal speech situation. 
in which inquirers or members of a community suspend or bracket prevailing beliefs and engage in rational discourse aimed at truth and governed by the force of the better argument, under conditions in which all participants in discourse have equal opportunities to engage in constative assertions of fact, normative, and expressive speech acts, and in which discourse is not distorted by the intervention of power or the internalization of systematic blocks to communication. Recent Pearsians, Cheryl Misak, and Robert B. Talis have attempted to formulate Pierce's theory of truth in a way that improves on Habermas and provides an epistemological conception of deliberative democracy. <laughs> Notes and references <laughs> <laughs> Further reading Allen, James Sloan, ed. William James on Habit, Will, Truth, and the Meaning of Life. Frederick C. Bale, Publisher, Savannah, Georgia. Aubrey, John, and Aubrey, Susan 1995. Interpretation as Action, The Risk of Inquiry. Inquiry, Critical Thinking Across the Disciplines 15, 40-52. Eprint Baldwin, J. M. 1901-1905, Dictionary of Philosophy and Psychology, three volumes in four, New York, New York. Dewey, John 1929, The Quest for Certainty, A Study of the Relation of Knowledge and Action, Minton, Bouch, and Company, New York, New York. Reprinted, pp. 1-254 in John Dewey, The Later Works, 1925-1953, Vol. 4-1929, Joe Ann Boydston, ed., Harriet First Simon, Text, ed., Stephen Toulman, Intro, Southern Illinois University Press, Carbondale and Edwardsville, Ill., 1984. Dewey, John 1938, Logic, The Theory of Inquiry, Henry Holt and Company, New York, New York, 1938. Reprinted, pp. 1-527 in John Dewey, The Later Works, 1925-1953, Vol. 12-1938, Joe Ann Boydston, ed., Kathleen Poulos, Text, ed., Ernest Nagel, Intro, Southern Illinois University Press, Carbondale and Edwardsville, Ill., 1986. Firm, Virgilius, 1962, Consensus Gentium, p. 64 in Runes, 1962. Hawk, Susan 1993, Evidence and Inquiry, Towards Reconstruction in Epistemology, Blackwell Publishers, Oxford, UK. Habermas, Jürgen What is Universal Pragmatics? First published. Was Height Universal Pragmatic? Sprech Pragmatic und Philosophie, Karl Otto Appel ed., Surkamp Verlag, Frankfurt am Main. Reprinted, pp. 1-68 in Jürgen Habermas, Communication and the Evolution of Society, Thomas McCarthy, Trans, Beacon Press, Boston, Massachusetts, 1979. Habermas, Jürgen, 1979, Communication and the Evolution of Society, Thomas McCarthy, Trans, Beacon Press, Boston, Massachusetts. Habermas, Jürgen, 1990, Moral Consciousness and Communicative Action, Christian Lenhart and Shieri Weber Nicholson, Trans, Thomas McCarthy, Intro, MIT Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Habermas, Jürgen, 2003, Truth and Justification, Barbara Faulkner, Trans, MIT Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts. James, William, 1907, Pragmatism, A New Name for Some Old Ways of Thinking, Popular Lectures on Philosophy, Longmans, Green, and Company, New York, New York. James, William, 1909, The Meaning of Truth, A Sequel to Pragmatism, Longmans, Green, and Company, New York, New York. Kant, Emanuel, 1800, Introduction to Logic. Reprinted, Thomas Kingsmill Abbott Trans, Dennis Sweet Intro, Barnes & Noble, New York, New York, 2005. Pierce, C.S., Writings of Charles S. Pierce, A Chronological Edition, Pierce Edition Project E.D.S., Indiana University Press, Bloomington and Indianapolis, in, 1981, Volume 1 1857-1866, 1981. Volume 2 1867-1871, 1984. Volume 3, 1872 to 1878, 1986. Cited as W volume, page. Pierce, C.S. Collected papers of Charles Sanders Pierce, vols. 1 to 6. Charles Harchern and Paul Weiss, E.D.S. Vols. 
Seven to Eight, Arthur W. Burks, ed. Harvard University Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 1931 to 1935, 1958. Cited as CP Volume. Pierce, C. S. The Essential Pierce: Selected Philosophical Writings, Volume One, 1867 to 1893. Nathan Hauser and Christian Closel, eds. Indiana University Press, Bloomington and Indianapolis, Indiana, 1992. Cited as EP1, page. Pierce, C.S., The Essential Pierce, Selected Philosophical Writings, Volume 2, 1893-1913, Pierce Edition Project, eds., Indiana University Press, Bloomington and Indianapolis, Indiana, 1998. Cited as EP2, page. Pierce, C.S. 1868. Some Consequences of Four Incapacities. Journal of Speculative Philosophy 2, 1868, 140 157. Reprinted CP 5.264 317, W 2 211 242, EP 128 55. Eprint. NB, misprints in CP and eprint copy. Pierce, CS. 1877. The Fixation of Belief. Popular Science Monthly 12, 1877, 1-15, reprinted, CP 5.358-387, W3-242-257, EP 1-109-123, eprint. Pierce, CS, 1878. How to Make Our Ideas Clear. Popular Science Monthly 12, 1878, 286-302. Reprinted CP 5.388 to 410, W3 to 257-276, EP1 to 124-141. Pierce, CS 1901, section entitled Logical, pp 718 to 720 in Truth and Falsity and Error. PP 716 to 720 in J M Baldwin ed Dictionary of Philosophy and Psychology Volume 2 Google Books eprint reprinted CP 5.565 to 573 Pierce CS 1905 What Pragmatism Is The Monist 15 161 to 181 Reprinted CP 5.411 to 437, EP 2 to 331-345. Internet Archive ePrint. Pierce, CS 1906. Basis of Pragmaticism. First published in Collected Papers, CP 1.573 to 574 and 5.549 to 554. Rescher, Nicholas 1995, Pluralism, Against the Demand for Consensus, Oxford University Press, Oxford, UK. Rorty, R. 1979, Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature, Princeton University Press, Princeton, N.J. Runes, Dagobert D. Ed. 1962, Dictionary of Philosophy, Littlefield, Adams, and Company, Totowa, N.J. Cited as D.O.P.